Welcome to Golf Smarter Mulligans, your second chance to gain insight and advice from the best instructors featured on the Golf Smarter podcast. Great golf instruction never gets old. Our interview library features hundreds of hours of game improvement conversations like this that are no longer available in any podcast app. Routine doesn't mean agonizingly slowly. It means doing essentially, and again, you know, he said strict routine, and that that raised a, a red flag for me. Strict routine becomes rigid and mechanical and slow. What I said was a regular routine. It doesn't have to be exactly the same each time, but the same principles included. If you're making a practice, you know, a feel swing, make one or two feel swings. Stand behind the ball, take a breath, walk up, look, and go. That doesn't take that long. What I think slows the pace of play down is not being ready and then starting your routine. If you're ready to start your routine as soon as it's your turn, it, it shouldn't take very long. With another interview from the archives of Golf Smarter, here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to the Golf Smarter podcast for members only, Dr. Joe. Good morning, Fred. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thanks for joining us once again. Uh, in our conversation that we published last week, you were talking about one of the students that you had who, when you suggested maybe you shouldn't play from the, bl- the blacks or from the back tips um, and that you should play, you know, at the members' tees, he didn't want to do that. He refused to do that. And then you also talked about how caught up he was in losing one of his Pro V1s, that he, yes. he was holding back on his swing um, because he didn't like, want to lose I like your comment. I also liked your comment that uh, Pro V stands for provisional, so I, I want to hit one of those. So I, I thought that was very cute, good, a, good, a good observation. But I, I, I don't know why this, it's not obvious to everybody. <laughs> in, this, in this particular situation, it was one hole that was, had a long, long carry, and he had been hitting rather weak, uh, pushed, slice drives all day long. I didn't think he could carry that one. I didn't have a problem with him playing from the back tees if there if there was no problem carrying to the fairway. And so w- what we did in that situation, uh, uh, I told him that he had to swing with more freedom, more, more abandon actually, not wild, but without holding back and being and, and guiding the swing so much because sure. it was that guiding quality that took all the power out. And um, so what I had him do was I had him stand up and say, I don't I, I, I need you to say to your golf ball, I don't care if I never see you again, I am making a free swing. So he had to aban- he had to give up his attachment to his to that golf ball and his concern about losing it, and primarily the worry about the results, because it was the worry about the results that was holding him back from making a free swing. That is the case for almost every golfer that has that quality of holding back, which almost every golfer has experienced that, because of worry about how the shot's gonna turn out, worry about the outcome, rather than just purely focusing on the process and trusting. Now, trust doesn't mean it's going to come out exactly the way you want it to, but trust lets you make that free swing, and you're trusting that either it will come out with a decent result, or you can handle however it does, uh, emotionally. Not handle physically, maybe it's behind a tree and you have to pitch out, but you can handle emotionally whatever happens, and therefore you don't hold back and you swing freely. So when he said that, he got up and hit a really beautiful shot, with even with a little draw. And he said, where was that? I said, it was available all the time. You just wouldn't let it out because you were afraid of what would happen. Right, right. It's interesting. I've uh, asked numerous um, directors of golf, uh, teaching instructors, uh, teaching professionals that have been on the show what do you find to be the most common mistake um, on, on the golf course by amateurs? And they frequently will say that they play from the wrong tees. I've oh, all, I agree completely. Right. I agree. Completely. But I've also had people come on and say that if you play from the back tees, no matter how good you are, you get into less trouble. Well, unless they're a force Because carry. you can't, right, you can't reach it. 
right? Uh, you it's can't good. you can't reach the trouble if you you. It depends on the course design. Uh, let's say you have a classic par four with a couple of bunkers on each side of the fairway in the landing area where it pinches in. Right. Well, if you go back to where you can't reach that, sure, no problem. Right. right. Uh, now, what I what when I coach better players, uh, I had a fourteen year old who's ranked. I think fourth in in uh, the nation in his uh, AJGA stats and and all of that, wow. and and we played. He hits it about two hundred eighty five yards. And he's fourteen. And, and he's fourteen. And we we got up to our. Uh, <laughs> that's his average drive. I asked, "What's your average drive?" Two two eighty five. So we got we got up to his ball, and it had rolled off the fairway into a downhill side hill lie in the rough. And I said, look 30 yards behind you. What do you see? And he said, fairway. I said, how wide is it? He said, about 50 yards wide. I said, you hit into an area 20 yards wide. Why not hit your three wood? The only difference is you're going to have you're going to have a pitching wedge instead of a sand wedge into the green. So, you know, what's the difference for you? Um, and he and he said, wow, I really should have thought about that. So there are a couple of options. If you play playing the forward tees, uh, allows you to have shorter um, shots on on long par threes. Uh, ones that, you know, you don't want to be hitting a three wood or a driver into a par three. That's not really, you know, once in a while courses are designed that way, but for high handicappers, it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do, and, and this is what, something that I recommend, uh, we actually have this, I, I teach at the Los Angeles Country Club, and they have uh, uh, on the scorecard, they have the blue tees, the white tees, and then they have a mix. They have called the Thomas tees, named after their designer George Thomas. Mm -hmm. And they have to and and you see, it's a mix of blue and white tees. So some of the holes you play on the back tee, some of the holes you play on the on the front on the members tee. Oh, that's interesting. And why not design your own golf course? Yeah, and you can have a, a lot of fun changing it around, playing your home course, and saying. Okay, well, look, uh, let's play all the par threes from the white tees, all the par, and half the par fours from the white and the blue. Let's play all the par fives from the blue tees. And, you know, it's a three shot hole anyway. What difference does an extra 40 yards make? Right. It's oh, a that's fun thing to do. It really is. It's interesting because, you know, we'll go back and play our favorite course over and over again, and we'll play the same tees every time. And yet, you know, it's like, ugh, I played this hole before, you know, and I keep getting into the same trouble. Why not change it around? Why not go ahead and say, you know, today I'm going to play from a different set of tees. It's going to be a different round of golf. Exactly. Now, what you can find is when you play, and, and sometimes play from the front tees. I don't really like to call them ladies tees. No. Because if you, if you put Michelle on the tee, that's not the right tee. Michelle Wee on the tee, she hits it 285 herself. Um, you know, she's playing from the, from the tips. Uh, Christy Kerr, who I work with, also uh, hits a, a, a pretty decent length drive. So we don't call them ladies' tees. You have the front tees, the middle tees, the back tees, and sometimes there are uh, five tee boxes, and you you get to pick and choose. You can pick and choose as long as the marker's there. They don't want you to to play on an open tee box. They set the markers so that they alternate the tees so they can grow back in. But but pick your spots, and sometimes play from the front tees. And, and work on your wedge game. Right. Sometimes you play from the back tees and work on your fairway wood and long iron game because you're going to have a fairway wood or a long iron in on every shot or a hybrid. I had a chance so, to... So yeah, don't I, make it practice rounds. Practice yeah. on, work on different things. So good. I had a chance to talk to Robert Trent Jones Jr. Um, and hopefully someday we'll get to publish that interview. And he said that he was designing uh, in some resort courses that he was working on putting children's tees. So like, you know, so they play from 150 yards in. So at a resort like Disney, it was for Disney, of course. Um, yeah. So the family can go out and play sense. and the kid. Yeah. And the kid just plays 150 yard hole and dad plays his normal hall. But it's a way to get the whole family involved. But my. Well, I, I actually have a, uh, uh, a formula for parents who are taking their young children out to play. Please share that. Uh, First of all, they have to get permission from the course to usually take any any children younger than than twelve years old or ten years old. I don't know the cutoffs are different for different courses, but uh, 
First of all, they love riding in the cart. Yep. Don't let them drive it, but they <laughs> they like riding in it. I have a oh. story where I made that mistake. I, I understand. <laughs> now, the uh, what you do is usually the the father or the mother tees off, and then the kid tees off and takes. You know, by the time you get to your ball, uh, you don't remember where you hit it, um, and people are stacked up behind you. Instead, why not you tee off and then you drive to the one fifty marker. Mm-hmm. And uh, in fact, don't you don't the adult doesn't have to tee off. Just play the course from the 150 markers. Mm-hmm. If they're really if they're really if they're younger, play it from the hundred yard markers. Mm-hmm. Now, what your job is as a parent is not to play your own ball, but to play. You're playing your own ball, but you're not hitting your own shot. Wherever your child hits the ball. Your job is to try to put your ball as close to theirs as you can. Now, that's going to help you work on your touch and your short game and, and your, your judging distances and finesse. So they hit, a, they hit their shot, and it's uh, 20 yards short of the green. You're not trying to hit the green from 150. You're trying to hit your ball close to theirs. Then the game becomes about them rather than about you, which they will enjoy. And... Uh, sometimes you'll be a little short of theirs and they'll say, oh, I hit it farther than daddy or I hit it farther than mommy. You know, they don't realize you're just trying to hit it to their ball. But it 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 will be so much fun. You get to play and you won't hold up the people behind you because when you finish a hole, voop, up you go to the 150 marker. Right. So they can still tee off most of the time. Up, you already, you're already done. You're already uh, well off the, the tee. Yeah. And that's a game that I recommend for taking juniors out, out to play. And then you say, you know, a maximum of three putts. Right. Once you're on the green. Otherwise, they'll play green hockey all over the place. That's, <laughs> well, that's, actually, that's actually more fun than putting the ball in the hole. That's, that's, one, <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the rules from Sorta Golf. I don't know if you're familiar with the folks at Sorta Golf. It's kind of tongue in cheek. They've been on the show before. Sorta Golf stands for the seven original, true, and ancient golf rules. And so it's sort of golf. So, right, exactly. It. And so, like, uh, he's got seven, the, uh, the that's, golfer's that's, bill of rights. That's cute. And there's well, seven, seven quick changes that he wants to make to the rules for I, the I recreational understand. golfer. And one of them is... Um, no more than three putts. No more than three putts. Yep, sounds good. Yeah, well, he has, some, right. he has some good ideas. Some of them are ridiculous. Double, you know, double bow... Well, actually, it's not no more than three putts. It's double mo- bogey is max. I'm not so sure about that. I'd go triple bogey because I do it too often. Um, but, you know, things like one in, one out, um, you know, it's like don't just play it where it lies. But if, if your ball goes out of bounds, just drop it. You know, just move forward. Pick up the pace. Anyway. Yep. Let's move right. forward. Yeah. But my, my favorite um, golf tee uh, anecdote, uh, since we were talking about playing from different tees and the different color tees, you know, generally where they have the front tees being the reds and the back tees being the blue, right? Well, here, yes. here in Northern California, the rivalry between Cal and Stanford in college sports has been going right. on for generations. I'm sure you're aware of this. Of course. And um, Stanford has their own golf course. Of course. And the red tees must be the back ones. And the blue the championship tees. Right. Tees. And the blue tees, which is the Cal color, is right. the quote-unquote ladies tees. Yes, so it's a dig, it's a dig at, at them. But um, the reason I brought this whole conversation up to bring it all the way full circle is to talk about ego and um, how I know that your main thing is I help golfers get out of their own way. Exactly. But and and we've talked about that numerous times, and mm-hmm. and I and I carry it with me always when you talk about. Well, that's that. great. Well, getting out of getting out of your own way is really. Um, having confidence in whatever level of ability you have and therefore not adding extra things that you need to do uh, uh, to play especially well that day, which only get in the way and make you play worse. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So when you deal with, you know, uh, competitive players on on almost all levels from juniors to Mm -hmm. high school to college, uh, LPGA, PGA, um, and you deal with amateurs as well. Um, where do you find 
ego getting in the way more often? What type of player do you see their ego um, forcing them to do things that they shouldn't be attempting? Well, there there are different personalities. Absolutely. Uh, the, and and it, it's not a, necessarily along male-female lines. No, no. Uh, no. The, there are macho golfers. There are men golfers who are macho, and there are women golfers who are macho. Uh, and that and that and the macho is not laying up, going for everything, uh, trying the hero shots every, every single time. Uh, and I have an interesting story about that, a um, uh, theory, actually, about that. Because we we often hear uh, that a high handicapper tries a ridiculously hard shot, you know, uh, over the under the branches of one tree, then hoping it'll get over the branches of the next tree, and then turn uh, and and bounce between two bunkers and onto the green. Uh, why why try why do they try shots that even pros wouldn't attempt? The pros would pitch out. Well, here's the reason why. If you're a high handicapper, what do you have to talk about when you get to the 19th hole? You don't get to talk about, you say, oh, man, I dusted the course today. Some smooth 94. I just watch out. Yeah, nobody, nobody gets to brag about a, <laughs> about, about a round in the 90s unless, unless they broke 100 for the first time. Right. Come on. Okay, that's great. That's <laughs> there are great. definitely people, okay. if they shot a 94 this week, would be really happy to start their season with a 94. They w- I'm not saying they wouldn't they wouldn't be happy. Right. But Don't is brag that about something it. you can walk in and brag about at the, you know, on the, you know, uh, over a drink after the after the round. Well, um, it depends if no, they're all but drinking. You can say you should have seen me on number 8. Yeah, I took it out of the rough under this branch over the next one. It faded just the way I wanted it to right between the bunkers rolled up 8 feet from the pin. Don't ask me about the putt. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what they get to brag about so yeah. they're going to try for those hero shots every time because if they happen to pull one off they've got their story 94 isn't that great a story no but a shot so, so, but that's so, why we play golf that's, is for that's that bit, shot <laughs> that's a little bit of the the ego the other the other styles are um somebody who wants to look good in front of everybody else and that that produces uh, sometimes produces the first tee jitters. Sometimes it produces making a very what what they think is a good looking swing, but turns out to be rather mechanical. And they're more concerned with uh, how they appear to others than than just figuring out a way to get the ball from the tee to the hole. Uh, we all have our different uh, kinds of things, different different places that we. Uh, pin our ego on or attach our ego to and and what it's about and you know some people uh most golfers aren't like this but some people you know they they kick the ball out of the woods because they're attached to the numbers on that scorecard and don't want and and uh want to appear that way and you know that's absolutely not in the spirit of the game but it is to protect their ego so what kind of egos get in the way uh, at the professional level? Well, ego on the golf course makes me think of the movie Tin Cup, where the two main characters were battling for the affection of a young lady and trying to prove to her which one of them could hit a seven iron farther. Uh, I, I actually, uh, in a corporate outing that I was leading, I do these corporate groups where I do a mental game seminar on golf and business. And then we go to the practice area of the range, and, and I go out on the course with them and, and play a hole with each foursome. And I, I ran into this gentleman who had an old set of clubs. Clearly, he, he only played these uh, cor- corporate outings and scramble charity tournaments a couple of times a year. And it was an uphill, into the wind, cold day, 170 yards. He takes out a seven iron. Now I said, uh, hang on a second. What's the plan here? And he knew that was golfer's code for, are you out of your mind? What do you think you're doing? <laughs> and he knew what I meant. So he said, it's okay. I hit this club that far once. No, he didn't say yes. that. Once? It's, he said a, once? It is a chapter in the new book. I hit this club that far once. 
Uh, and so that becomes his club of choice. It was probably downhill, uh, the wind behind him on a hard course, and it bounced and rolled 40 yards. But uh, that's the ego of golf. We, we don't want to see our great shots wasted by hitting it over the green. So we'd rather hit 9 out of 10 short and catch that 1 out of 10 that we really catch it and, and hit the distance that we think we can hit. Uh, and ego in golf has to do also with um, what people think of you. So we care more about how we look on the golf course than, than playing the game. Uh, it, it, the whole it thing really, on the first it tee. It really changes. Uh, and that's why, why are we nervous on the first tee? Because of what we think people will, will think of us. And I tell people to relax. They don't care about you. <laughs> they're worrying about their own shot. All they care about is themselves. And you, you know, hit a bad I, shot. They're, they're not thinking about how bad you are. They're just going, please don't let me do that. Please right. don't let me. Do that. <laughs> but, you know, I was relax. also thinking about that, that chapter when I was reading it about the first tee thing. and. There's there's two there's another way to look at this that I saw is one if you have a really good shot off the first tee mm -hmm. and you think that other people are watching yes you're setting a precedence that they're going to think uh oh I'm not going to be able to compete with this guy because wow look at him how, right off the box he's he's really good and then you start playing your normal golf because it's always going to catch up with you no matter how you start your game you know you could be playing really well and. Recently, it happened to me. I, I was, um, I had uh, uh, six pars after eight holes, and I tripled the one, <laughs> number nine. Right? It's like, yeah, you, your golf has to catch up with you. But um, so you, you can set the expectations too high, or if you have a crappy shot on your first one, then you can relax because now it can only get better. Yes, there are all sorts of ways that the amazing golfer's mind can rationalize things. <laughs> really, really amazing. We're, we're incredibly creative. And uh, usually the rationalizations just uh, make things more complicated. So we might make it a little bit simpler and, again, turn our attention to process rather than results and say, you know, all I can do is the best chance I have for a good result is to not worry about the result mm. and get out of my own way and just let the swing happen. If I, if I hit it the way I like, I want to reinforce it. If I don't, I want to learn from it. And that's basically it. You know, I, I was working with a college team and I was uh, talking with each player individually and I asked, uh, what happens when you have a bad round? And they said, well, I get pretty upset. And I said, do you learn anything from it? And they went, uh, no. I said, well, what a waste then. What a waste of a bad round. If you have a bad round, use it as an opportunity to learn from it and make a plan for how to do some work on your game to improve it. That's then no round of golf is wasted. Interestingly enough, I interviewed somebody once, and they said that, and it was interesting because they said this just before Thanksgiving of 2009, they said that Tiger Woods has no ego. <laughs> that came out to be quite different. But what he meant, what he was, when I, and I, I said, like, explain that, please. What do you mean by that? He says, Tiger Woods will never take a shot on the golf course that he's not absolutely confident in taking, that he hasn't done in practice 100,000 times before. So his ego doesn't get in the way like, I got to make this shot. I'm going to do something I've never done before. He's totally confident in his ability that whatever shot he takes, there's no ego involved. He knows he can do it. I thought uh, that was an interesting yeah, that's, assessment. That's an interesting, it's an interesting question. I wouldn't equate that with ego. I okay. would equate that with, with um, playing smart and playing within your, your capabilities. Just because you try a shot that you've never tried before, that doesn't mean you're doing it out of ego. Uh, that that means that you're um, doing it somewhat out of desperation, and maybe making a bad course management decision. Uh, the the thing with Tiger is he's practiced so many of those, and he has uh, an unconditional belief in his abilities, uh, and and he can hit most of those shots. 
what we what we find what we find uh, the the ego part coming out comes out with uh, it's more like it's more on the order of pride or embarrassment and and what other people will think of you or say about you if you you know on on the pro level uh i you know i think that there's uh some aspect for some players when they get in the hunt of changing their game plan and going to a prevent defense because they don't want to be interviewed and be said, you know, why did you make that mistake? Wasn't that a bonehead play? Why did you go for it on, you know, when you didn't have to? Those, those kinds of things. You had a three-shot lead. You're going in number 17. Why'd you, why'd you pull out the driver, right? Yeah, those, those, kind, yeah. those kinds of things. Um, but, uh, but for the most part, uh, keep in mind that they're playing for their, and th- uh, this is another part where the ego can come in, playing for their reputation, for their place in the game, for their place in history. So the pressure really, uh, it comes down to a subtler thing. It's not ego in the sense of egotistical, uh, bragging I'm the greatest and, uh, and, uh, and a tremendous amount of pride. It's a more subtle quality of hope and fear, of hope that one could become what one always dreamed of the u s open or the masters champion or the uh, um, hero of the Ryder Cup or the Solheim Cup or something like that there's the hope there, and then there's the fear of not being able to fulfill one's dreams or expectations, and those vibrate very strongly when pressure comes in, but that's no different when we're talking about the pro level than the 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 player playing for their club championship for the first time and feeling that same feeling because that's their reference point of their culture. Hope and fear, hope and fear. Those are the, uh, the challenges right. that we have to overcome to play our best golf and covered in your book. Go beyond, fe- go beyond fear and let go of uh, of hope, because both of those have to do with what is going to happen in the future. And that's not something that you can control. Do your best to control what you're doing in the present. Uh, always keep me on track, Doc. You're always keeping me on track. Hey, let's take some questions from the uh, audience uh, mm-hmm. that I think are, are relevant to what you profess. Um, and I think you have great answers for this. So we'll start with a question from Jordan Ristish in Prescott, Arizona, and he says, can you please explain the value of a pre-shot routine and make any suggestions regarding the proper setup prior to executing it? Now, let's stay away from that. Let's talk about the value of a pre-shot routine. Okay, well, it it comes into the setup a little bit, but uh, uh, Jordan, the the value of the pre-shot routine is to make the game more familiar, each shot more familiar and more regular. Uh, If we're playing tennis, uh, on a particular day, that court doesn't change over the course of the day, uh, especially indoor tennis if there's no breeze. Uh, you're going to be playing, uh, each time you serve, you're serving to uh, the, same, the same place, either one side or the other, the service box, but basically it's the same situation. In golf, every shot is different. What you want to do is make them more regular and more familiar. So having the same routine, not rigidly the same, but a regular routine puts you in a situation of when you get over the shot, you're able to flow into the swing or the putting stroke, feeling very comfortable, more comfortable and more familiar because you've gone through the same routine. Now, familiar means more comfortable because we are more comfortable in familiar situations than unfamiliar situations. Comfortable means uh, that we're more relaxed. We're more relaxed in comfortable situations than uncomfortable situations. And we trust ourselves in those familiar, comfortable situations more than in unusual or awkward situations, which means we'll trust our swing and be able to make a freer, less manipulated, less uh, guided swing. 
So how does that impact um, pace of play? Like uh, we received another email for a while ago. Someone's saying that they're concerned that they may be playing too slowly. He's got a very strict pre-shot routine, especially on the green with his putts. But mm-hmm. his regular foursome is starting to razz him a little bit about taking too much time. And he wants to accommodate them and pick up the pace, but he's very comfortable with this pre-shot routine. How does he accommodate himself and his playing partners as well? I was just listening uh, to a telecast about that. Uh, the rounds at the Honda Classic were, it's a very difficult golf course, and they were really, really slow. The pros were playing in upwards of over five hours, a five and a half hour round. <laughs> and that's not in a pro-am. They're used to that in a pro-am, not in a, in a regular round. And uh, one of the people said, you know, one of the problems is sports psychologists who tell them to breathe and do all of these things. And I, I took a, a a little umbrage with that. Because, a little? Uh, uh, Are you what kidding? I, <laughs> this well, is what you, know you what? do, Doc. I don't. I I'm. I can't speak for everybody else. There's maybe some uh, instructors who recommend that, but they were talking. You know, they said, "Why not play a little bit of Ricky Fowler golf?" I mean, he just gets up and whacks it. <laughs> Lee Trevino did the same thing, right. but that doesn't mean they didn't have a routine. Routine doesn't mean agonizingly slowly. It means doing essentially, and again, you know, he said strict routine, and that that raised a, a red flag for me. Strict routine becomes rigid and mechanical and slow. What I said was a regular routine. It doesn't have to be exactly the same each time, but the same principles included. If you're making a practice, you know, a feel swing, make one or two feel swings. Stand behind the ball, take a breath, walk up, look, and go. That doesn't take that long. What I think slows the pace of play down is not being ready and then starting your routine. If you're ready to start your routine as soon as it's your turn, it, it shouldn't take very long. And you can time it, have somebody watch you and say, I'm starting my routine now. And then when they hear the click of the ball, that's the, that's the end. And say, how long did that take? And shorten it up. And they were talking about J.B. Holmes, who... Um, Played very, very slowly, had a long, long, drawn-out routine. In fact, he'd walk up, have a hitch in his step, take a step back, walk up again, uh, waggle forever. And he changed it and plays faster now. And, of course, the announcer said, and he'll probably play better. I think so, too. If your routine is so slow that you have time for doubts and uh, swing thoughts to fill your mind about how you're going to swing the club, that's really going to get in your way. The most important thing about routine is flow. You're supposed to flow through the shot. So you don't stand frozen over the ball forever going through a checklist of 20 different things that you're supposed to do while you swing. Uh, this is how I'm going to tell you now. This is what I feel like a pace of a, of a routine can be. You go swing, swing. Okay, stand behind. Breathe. Walk up, one, two, three. Set the club, set the feet, set the feet a little more. Waggle, look, and go. How long did that take? I don't think so. <laughs> and you know what? No, if that was a good pace. You, it's... If you are ready to start that. I get rid of the waggle. <laughs> if you're ready to start that as soon as the uh, the... The player behind you has hit, uh, and you can walk in, and you don't start checking your yardage then. You know, there are different things you can do. When, when you're playing in a cart, you don't have to sit there. Until it's your turn. Yeah. For the drive up. You know, let them hit. And make sure they've got the clubs they need. You go up even with your ball. Check your yardage there. And let them hit. And I'm not saying to go in front of them. Go safely to the side. But there are ways to leapfrog it and and play that you get a little more exercise and it moves along faster. Next question. Next question. Let's go to Paul Gomez in Rogers, Arkansas. He says, I'm a competitive golfer playing some of the best golf of my life. Sometimes I find that I freeze over the ball because I can't decide where to let my eyes focus. 
I don't think I normally focus on a specific spot, letting my eyes kind of go blurry. Then I panic, and I think I should focus on a dimple, a letter, or something specific. Inevitably, it results in a bad shot. Why do I do that? Should I pick a specific focus point? Well, uh, the why uh, is an expression of uh, a lack of trust. And chances are, when you feel good about the shot, and you have a dis, you know you've made a decisive choice about the club you're going to hit the shot you're going to play you feel confident about the distance you feel confident about your your swing you're not going to be thinking about where your eyes are and what you're doing it's going to it's going to flow naturally what i think happens is when when this uh um player has that situation they're not really certain about other things as well. And so they get nervous and their eyes start moving around and they start to worry about where they should be looking. But why not make a commitment to say, and in Zen putting, I I have a chapter called Soften Your Gaze. What I like to do is have the person be looking toward the golf ball, but be able to see their uh, if they're putting to see the hole or their, the first few feet of their path out of the corner of their eye. And if it's full shot, maybe you have an intermediate target a few feet in front of you. Soften your gaze so that you have a sense of that area in front of you. And that's where your energy is going to be sending the ball through that and out towards your ultimate target. So I like, it's not exactly going fuzzy. But it's similar. It's looking toward the ball, but softening your gaze. Now, if somebody isn't comfortable with that, then pick a spot that they're looking at consistently. Front of the ball, the back of the ball. For people who uh, tend to hit the ball thin, why not look an inch in front of the ball and say, that's where the bottom of my swing is going to, uh, the swing arc is going to bottom out. Uh, and, and I'm going to be taking a little divot after I hit the ball. Try different things on the range and find the place that you're resting your eyes that are most comfortable for you. Either soften your gaze, look toward the ball and soften your gaze, or pick a spot in front of uh, or on the ball that you can look at. So now I'm, I'm curious to ask you about uh, warming up Bef- before your round, not on a pre-shot routine, but a pre-round routine. Um, say that there is no warm-up area, no, no hitting bays, no driving range on this golf course, um, or, or even say that you're pulling in late, which, is, which happens, right? You don't always get enough mm-hmm. time to warm up. What would you advise to be more important on, loosen, on getting prepared, mentally or physically? Uh, you can do both. Uh, and one of the things is to make sure that you – have some flexibility and motion. So uh, stretch a little bit and then either swing two clubs. I I worked with Carlos Franco for a while. He didn't hit balls before he went up for the round. He just swung two clubs and got a feel for his swing path, his tempo, and his timing. And that's really all you need to do. Or you can use a weighted club. Uh, There's a training uh, device that you'll see on my website called the Orange Whip that I recommend. And uh, that gives you a great feel, and it's a great warm-up tool. Yeah, I've been seeing then, that lately. Yeah, and and then we go and uh, uh, and then uh, what I like players to do is actually pretend there's a ball there and go through not their necessarily their full routine, but at least go through their their setup and set up as if there's a ball there, and really make a swing as if there's a ball there, and feel what that's going to feel like when they get up to the ball. Uh, if there's no place to, to, if there's no range to hit, then a little chipping and putting. Uh, and as far as the mental game goes, rehearse mentally your routine that you're going to have before each shot of getting a feel for the, sw- the, the shot you're going to play, standing behind the ball and connecting to your target, breathing your energy down, walking in and flowing through your swing without freezing over the ball. I find for for me it's really uh, interesting how if I get to a golf course uh, too late to have any sort of warm up that I feel comfortable with, 
not only will I feel rushed um, getting, you know, getting started on my round, but it takes me sometimes two or three holes to get to a comfortable rhythm or a pace that I feel like I'm not being rushed or that I'm not feeling like I'm moving behind everybody. Well, anxiety has a, uh, a particular effect on us. What it does is it moves our energy up. So it moves it more out of our body and into our head. So we do a lot more thinking. Our mind feels like it's racing. Uh, and we uh, don't have a really good feel because our energy isn't so much in our body. Uh, we don't really have a good feel for our uh, flow, our tempo, our timing. The other thing that anxiety does is because our mind is racing, everything seems like it's moving faster. And we don't have time to make decisions. Uh, it, we feel rushed. Now, the, the key to uh, preventing that as much as possible, I'm not saying 100%, but prevent to, to minimize that is to do some breathing, just slow, full breathing, not so much, not so big, deep breaths that you hyperventilate, but just slow breathing and just a gentle swaying motion of half swings, taking the club halfway back and halfway through and feeling the rhythm through impact and just getting that it's almost, it, it, it has a pacifying feeling just back and through, and back, and through, and that'll settle you down. If you have time to warm up, what I would suggest is, after you've hit a few balls, don't work on any new swing techniques. This isn't a practice session. This is a warm-up session. Just warm up and get those half swings, hit balls with half swings, then a few full swings, and go through uh, from short to long on your clubs, depending on how much time you have. But before you go out, Play a few imaginary holes with full pre-shot routine. Tee a ball up with your driver for if the first hole is a par four or a par five. Stand behind it. Create an imaginary fairway out of the flags on the range and really try to hit it in that fairway. You will, start, you will feel what it feels like on the first tee. And you might not hit that great a shot, but you've gotten one of those out of the way. After you've played two or three imaginary holes, by the time you get to the first tee, you'll feel like you're already on the fourth hole and you're in your course rhythm. Uh, and you'll find a description of that in Zen Golf in uh, taking your range game to the course. I think the chapter is actually from the practice tee to the first tee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it is too. Actually, Good. I do remember. Um, and here's a question, uh, one last question that we have from Mike Stauffer of, Palmyra, Pennsylvania. And this would generally be, I guess, a question for uh, a swing instructor, but I'm real curious to know how you would approach it as a mental coach. He says, a member of my foursome went from shooting in the 80s last year to the point that he can barely hit the ball this year. He picks up most every hole. Can't hit a drive more than 180 yards. Half his drives go 40 yards left and only 10 yards out. He says he knows that he's not watching the ball and is swinging too hard, but admits he cannot stop. Can you help him, please? Well, let's see. That is an interesting one. Um, I don't think it's so much uh, for a swing instructor as it is uh, for him to be able to change his habits. Um, I think there's a chapter in Zen Golf called Beware of Trying for a Few Extra Yards. And what it might help is if he took that to heart, and actually didn't try to hit the drive farther. I don't know if you've ever seen these uh, little toys. They're a woven bamboo tube, uh, small, just a few inches long and about, uh, about finger width in diameter. And you stick your index fingers in each end. And if you try to pull them out, the tube gets tighter. And the harder you pull, the tighter it gets. Yeah, we're, they're like hand, uh, Asian hand. Bamboo handcuffs. Bamboo or handcuffs. handcuffs or something Finger like that. Finger cuffs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, um, that's really what happens in golf for many players. When something Great goes analogy. Wrong, when something goes wrong, they try to do more of what's getting them in trouble. And then it gets worse. And then they try to do more. 
And the more they do, the worse it gets. So the, t- the, the harder they pull to get out, the more stuck they get. Now, what he needs to do is say, you know, my, what's my job? Uh, my job is to put the ball in play. So here's what I'd like to suggest with the driver. Change the focus. Instead of the driver being the club that you try to hit the farthest, say, my driver is what, what they called in Scotland in the old days, the play club. It was called the play club because its job was to put the ball in play. So if you say, why don't you see if you can hit your driver 175 yards? And just swing hard enough to hit your driver 175 yards, no harder. Probably he'll hit it out there at least that far, maybe farther. And that will undo the cycle of trying harder and trying to hit the ball hard, you know, trying to swing faster and hit the ball harder, which, as we know, uh, only gets in one's own way on the golf course. Very, very good. I love the imagery that you have with that bamboo handcuff. That, that is, it just makes it so clear, like, you're pulling really hard. You're gonna, it's only going to get worse. You're just getting, just getting more stuff. Oh, so good. So Great. good. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Fred. Uh, well, no, thank you, Dr. Joe. And uh, let's tell everyone once again, um, you can come to uh, the Golfer Smart at golfsmarter.com because we have all three of Dr. Joe's books, Zen Golf, Zen Putting, and his la- latest, uh, Golf, The Art of the Mental Game, 100 Classic Golf Tips. And again, it is such an important book to have on your shelf in any room of your house because each chapter is a page. But it's um, in addition to that page is phenomenal artwork by the great Anthony Ravielli. Um, and so it just makes it look and feel like one of the classic golf books that everybody should own. Thanks, Fred. Uh, also uh, on audible.com and at uh, in iTunes, you can download the uh, audiobooks of each of these books. Uh, so if you want to hear more Dr. Joe, Dr. Joseph Parent, you can and get his lessons directly out of his book. It's well worth the read. It's important stuff. And honestly, it is the basis of where Golf Smarter started. And that's why you were episode number one. Thanks. Thanks, Fred. It's been a pleasure working with you all these years. Thank you, and uh, we will talk again at another point, and hopefully we're not going to go as long as we did this time. We'll talk to you soon. Call me anytime. Thanks a lot, Fred. <laughs>